everybody. It's good to see you. I wasn't supposed to see you at this time slot of the service, but here we are. Um, Pastor Dennis, my dad, uh, woke up and does not have a voice. And being a preacher and not having a voice is a combination that is no good, um, especially when um, it's your one day of the week to work and you can't talk. So I got a text about 8.30 this morning saying, hey, you're up. And I said, okay, let's piece something together real quick. And then I texted a few other people and said, hey, you're up. <laughs> and I, I just think that that's awesome that we have a bunch of people and, and Pastor Dennis, my dad, leading us and uh, trusting us and allowing us to do these things and raising us up so that when there is something like this that happens, we can just fill in the role and um, do what we are called to do. And I appreciate that and am so thankful for that. Merry Christmas, everybody. I hope you had a great Christmas yesterday and Christmas weekend as it continues. We've been in a series talking about grace, grace among us, and, and this whole month we've been talking about grace and anticipating Jesus coming and um, the Advent season and the great expectation of the Messiah coming, and I want to continue that, and I want to talk to you about two things. I want to talk to you about grace and peace today. We're going to talk about grace and peace because we know if you've been here for a little bit, you know that we talk about the kingdom and how the kingdom is upside down to the world, right? You might get tired of hearing that if you've been here for a little bit. If this is your first time, glad you're here. Let me introduce you to something. The world is backwards from the way we are supposed to live in the kingdom. Jesus came to show us how we are to live, and that's called kingdom living. And, and it's completely upside down. It's completely flipped from the way that the world has messed this thing up. And, and so Jesus comes down from his, you know, royal throne in heaven and comes to a place called earth so that we would have the opportunity to choose to live with a kingdom mindset, with kingdom principles, and be completely transformed in a, a new way. That's ridiculous. Let's not Let's not overcomplicate this idea. Let's keep it simple. But it's so mind-boggling to when we think about what Jesus actually did. He left his comfort. He left his rightful place in heaven to come down so that we might choose to live for him. It wasn't even a guarantee. I, I don't know that I would do anything like that if you didn't guarantee me first that you were going to do what I wanted you to do. You, you, you understand that? Like, it doesn't make any sense. This is why we have contracts that we need to sign, and if you mess up, then, you know, Jesus didn't have that. He said, I'm going to give you the opportunity. I'm going to invite you to do this, and I'm going to do this even without the guarantee that you are actually going to change your thinking, to change your life, to change your ways, and follow me into this way of life. That's insane. Let's not ever forget that. I think that that is what's called a power move. Anybody know what a power move is? Have you heard the term power move? I think power moves are awesome. I'm kind of sarcastic sometimes. I'm kind of like immature sometimes. And I just, I, here, let me tell you what a power move is. It's when someone pulls a stunt that shows he or she has outdone others and retains complete control of the situation. And dares anyone else to challenge what they just did. Another definition of, of a power move is asserting your dominance via an action that you take. Let me give you some examples that you may or may not have experienced before or done yourself. A power move is taking the last slice of pizza out of the box without asking anybody else if they want it first. That's a power move. A power move is going to the grocery store and going to the 20 items or less line and having 21 items. 
power move right there. A power move, parents, you might have experienced this one. A power move is when your child is looking at you and does the exact thing that you're telling them not to do in that moment. You know that stare that they're doing? Don't touch that. Don't touch. And they're looking at you, and they touch it. Power move. When I was in seventh grade, I accidentally asserted my dominance and, and, and experimented with this term power move. I, seventh grade, in math class, I think it was every Friday we took the math test, and, and you did that, you turned it in, and then on Monday you come back in and we went through corrections, and we uh, got our own tests, and we, we were able to, you know, if, if we made mistakes, we could fix it and then turn it back in and get some extra points back or, or whatever it was. But our teacher had a couple rules when it came to going over corrections. She would say, clear off your desks, put everything away. The only thing that you're allowed to have on your desk is the test that you took on Friday and a pencil to make corrections. But you are not allowed to be touching your pencil while I'm talking. Those were the rules. One Monday morning, I walk in there. Case of the Mondays, maybe. I just forgot what the rules were. She probably went over them. I was tired, whatever. I have my pencil in my hand. I'm holding my pencil. And there was just this awkward silence. And I'm just waiting. I'm looking at my test. I'm like, all right, I got this one wrong. I'm waiting to, to see what I need to, to fix. And I'm sitting there waiting, looking. No words. And I let this go on for about a minute. And then I finally look up, and she's looking right at me. And she looks at me and looks at my hand. And looks at me and looks at my hand. And I look at my hand, and I realize I'm holding my pencil. The unpardonable sin in this math class. (laughs) But I'm in seventh grade, and I'm a little immature, and I realize I have all the power right now. And so I let this draw out for a little bit. And I just hold that pencil. Complete silence. It was awesome. (laughs) Then I finally put it down, and immediately when I put it on the desk, she said, okay, let's go over question one. I'm like, are you kidding me? Anyway, power moves. Jesus has the ultimate power moves. When we read the Bible, we see power move after power move after power move. Jesus starts this off by turning water into wine in a split second. That's a power move. Jesus walks on water. Try that at a party and see how that goes for you. If you can pull that off, you will be on TikTok in no time and you will be trending like Jesus sleeps during storms. That's a power move. When we can be in the midst of a storm and be fast asleep, that's a power move. Jesus spits in dirt, throws mud at a person's face, and says, now you can see. He could have done it some other way, but he's got the power. He's asserting his dominance in this situation. He says, I'm going to throw mud in your face, and then you'll be able to see. Power move. This is how I read the Bible, guys. I, it, it's so much fun to read the Bible like this. Jesus has a lot of fun. I don't think Jesus was just this lame dude that, that you know, oh, just be peaceful, man. Like, Jesus knows how to have fun. Jesus has a sense of humor, okay? So we can have a sense of humor in this. Jesus destroys a tree just because it didn't have any fruit on it when he wanted an apple or a fig, I guess. That's a power move. Jesus died, defeated death in hell, and rose back to life. That is the ultimate power move. Nothing will top that. No, nothing that we ever do will ever compare to that move right there. Jesus says, let me assert my dominance into this world 
and prove to you how much I love you, how much I want you to have peace, how much grace I have for you, knowing everything that you've ever done, knowing the decisions that you might make in the future. I know all of these things, yet I'm still going to come down and prove to you that I have dominance and dominion in this world. I'm bringing the kingdom down with me, and I'm going to show you what it means to live. I'm going to show you what it means to have joy. I'm going to show you what it means to walk in power when you're walking in my name. Dominance looks different in the kingdom. Dominance isn't sitting behind the desk holding your pencil because you realize that you have power over your teacher for a couple minutes. Dominance is laying your life down. Dominance is humbling yourself. Dominance is serving those around you so that they may have life, so that they may experience grace, so that they may experience peace. And as we give that, we receive back more and more of that. And the only way that you can really experience that is by actually doing it. Jesus came down. We think of dominance as he's going to come as a king. Everybody thought he was going to come, just take over the government, just take over everything. And he said, nope, I'm going to come as a baby. This power move is Peter getting in his face and saying, I'm not going to let them arrest you. And Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan. This is part of the plan. This is what has to happen. Grace is a power move. Let me read some verses to you from from the book of John. It says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We could just stop there and think about that. Because like I already said, it doesn't make any sense for Jesus to leave where he was to come down to us without a guarantee that we would turn our lives around. He made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Our very existence is in response to grace. The only reason that we are here is because of God's grace. As a parent, I understand this a lot more. The only reason they are still here is because of the grace that I have given them. The only reason that I am still here is because of the grace I received from my parents from time to time. The only reason that you're here, you see, okay. So we experience this. Now let's think about this as a global scale. The only reason humanity is still here, the only reason that we still have a chance right now is because of God's grace. Because he came down and dwelt among us to show us what it means to live. John 15, it says this, John testified concerning him, talking about John the Baptist. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Grace was God's plan from the beginning. That's a power move. When you know what's going to happen and it happens and you just stand there like, yeah, I planned this. That's a good feeling. That's who Jesus is. That's God. That's our Father. That's our leader. That's the one. He knows what's going to happen. I want to follow somebody who knows what's going to happen. I want to follow somebody who knows what comes after this step. Even though I'm unsure about this one, he knows the next five. And I can follow him and I can trust him because he has it all laid out for us. He's just inviting us to say, come follow me. You're trying to go this way where those steps are going to be unsure. I'm bringing you here where this one is going to lead to the one that I have already laid out for you. You just have to trust me and listen to my voice and follow me every step of the way. Are you with me? Verse 16, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God is in closest relationship with the Father. He has made him known. And Jesus, the one closest to the Father, has come down 
to bring closeness with us. To, to call us friend. To, to, to bring us into a relationship so that we too can be with the Father. Grace is a power move. Peace is a power move. And it's one that the world is constantly looking for. And the answer is right here. In Philippians 4, it says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Listen, happiness that is dependent on our circumstances will always lead to disappointment. If, if we are so dependent on this has to happen and this has to happen and this person has to be here and this person has to do this for me, you will be disappointed every single time. But confidence in Christ and our trust in Jesus will always justify the joy that we are feeling and that we have and that we can display to the world. Our confidence in Jesus justifies our joy. And, and it's, it's not just, you know, thinking positively. Oh, things are going to be okay. Everything is good. Everything, like, that works. Let's do that. Let's think positive instead of negative. Like, that just makes sense, and, and that's how I want to live anyway. It's trusting God, though, that he is in charge and he is going to do what he says he's going to do as long as we follow where he's leading us. And when we do that, and when we trust that, he's going to fill us with joy that we won't be able to explain, but it's going to be evident to everybody, including ourselves. Verse 6 said, Thanksgiving, uh, with thanksgiving, present your request to God by prayer and petition. Thanksgiving is our medicine for anxiety. And peace is our reward. Thanksgiving and prayer and praise and worship, that's our medicine for everything that is happening around us. And we receive peace as the reward when we do those things. And I invite you to try those things. Jesus, one time, he was... Um, he knew he was about to get arrested. He's at the, the Last Supper with his disciples, about to be arrested, and he's explaining everything to the disciples, and, and he's trying to help them understand that this is what's going to happen, and this is what's going to happen after that. And you, he says, you're not going to fully understand this, but one day you will. After all of this is complete, you'll, you'll understand. And, and he says, the Holy Spirit is coming. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to guide you. And you're going to know what to do. And it's good that I go away so that the Holy Spirit can come. Because then it will be for everybody. And he says this in John 14. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Later on he says, remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Peace will leave if we leave the source of life. If we cut ourselves off from the, the life-giving vine, we can't expect to keep peace in our lives. We can't expect to have joy in our lives. Peace will, fit, will fade when we try to take matters into our own hands, when we try to go our own path, when we try to do our own thing. But the power of peace comes when we abide. The power of peace comes when we abide. Wesley said, we've been given laws and rules and all of these things, not so that we can make sure that everybody else is keeping them. It's not for everybody else. It's for you. It's not my job to make sure that you are doing what Jesus has told you to do. It's my job to make sure I'm doing what Jesus told me to do. And when I do that, I am abiding in him and I have full peace with him and I am in full joy with him because I'm in constant relationship with him and I'm so close to him in that moment 
You can't be closer than when you're abiding in him. John 16, says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Uh, uh, I think it was a few months ago now, we, in, in Elevate, our student ministry, we um, asked everybody to memorize a verse. And we said, let's memorize Psalm 23. And this is another one of those verses where it's probably plastered on walls, it's probably in picture frames, it's probably on coffee mugs and all that stuff. And it can become one of those things where, oh yeah, I know that one. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that. But, but listen to these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. When we were, when we were memorizing this, I was stuck on this verse, not because I couldn't memorize it, but because sometimes I can get in my head that I need more. I have to have more. There's, there's got to be more. But when I'm following him, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is going to guide my steps. He's the lamp unto my feet. I can only see so much. I don't know what's over here, but I know that he is my shepherd. I know that he's going to guide me. I know that when I abide in him, he is going to guide me. I might not like it every time. It might not be fun every day. It might be challenging sometimes. But I will lack nothing. I will not be without anything that I need for where I'm at and where I'm going. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Sometimes you just need to take a nap. (laughs) You're so busy going, 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 doing, 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 worrying about this and that and the other thing. Just in Jesus' name, shut up, sit down, and take a nap. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And if you don't do that, if you don't listen to that, he will find a way. You will burn out. Whether that's mentally, physically, whatever, he will find a way. He will make us lie down in green pastures. So let's just do it the easy way and just take a nap. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The ultimate power move in this world is responding to his invitation to live knowing we are covered in grace and that we can walk in his peace. It's an invitation and it's not, it's, it's not something that, that I'm going to cram down your throat or anything like that. It, it's something that, here's what this is. This is on you now. This is your decision <laughs> One thing that we do in Elevate, our student ministry, is usually around the first week or two that, that we've been meeting, you know, we have 6th graders through 12th graders, and we will tell them, this relationship between you and Jesus is between you and Jesus. This is not something that you're riding the coattails of, of your parents' relationship if they have one. This is something that you need to decide. And and what I like about what we do at Elevate is we treat our students like adults. And we say, this is no joke. There's no junior Holy Spirit. There is the Holy Spirit. And, And he will work through 
a 66-year-old or a 6-year-old. And it's our job to respond to his invitation. It's our responsibility to say, God, I, I, I wasn't paying attention. And maybe this is somebody in here. I wasn't paying attention my whole life. But, but this kid that's on the stage right now that desperately needs a haircut is telling me something. And as I look back on the things that you have done in my life, God, you have kept me from this. And, and you, you brought this person into my life at the exact moment that I needed it. And, and yeah, I tried to go my own way over here, but for some reason that didn't work. And, and you brought me to this place. And I didn't fully understand why, and I was kind of mad that I didn't get to go my own way at the time, but God, now I'm starting to think this was you. You ever think back on your life and think through those things? God, I'm starting to think that you, you, were, you were working in my life even before I knew your name. You know what that's called? Grace. You were doing things you were preparing things. You were shaping things before I even knew who you were. Wow. Let's not forget that. And I pray that eyes are open, that heart, I pray that my eyes always remember that. And constantly see that. Because even after we receive Christ, even after we receive salvation, even after we are, are, are living this life, it's an everyday opportunity for us to choose him. So it doesn't matter if you don't believe in him right now. I pray that before you leave, you get to know his name. Or if you've been walking with him for years we wake up and say, Jesus, I choose you again today. Thank you for your invitation. Ephesians 2 says this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. He's talking about the world. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. Christians, Let's not forget about that. If we forget those first four verses in Ephesians 2, that's when we become like the Pharisees, when we think we're better. I've got longevity. I've got tenure. You can't, you, there's no tenure in the Christian faith. Okay? Let's stay humble. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Wow. I don't cry often. Man. Just kidding. But when we look at scripture, it should move us. 
in a way that we can't explain. We were talking in uh, our staff meeting last week because Melissa was up here last week and she read some scriptures and, and she started tearing up just from reading the scripture. I was this person. I was dead. I had nothing. I grew up in the church. I'm a pastor's kid. That means I got my ticket to heaven. (laughs) No. I am this person. I was dead in my transgressions and sins. I, I followed the ways of the world. I heard the invitation into grace and peace and salvation and everything changed for me. I grew up in the church since I was probably five or six years old. I didn't want to work in the church. My goal was to show up on Sunday and do my thing for the rest of the week. When I was in high school, that's what I As things progressed and senior year of high school came around and, you know, everybody's asking that dumb question, what are you going to do after high school? I don't know. We need to figure it out. You got to have your whole life planned by the time you're 18 years old because if you don't, then your life is going to fall off a cliff. No, get out of here. Anyway, soapbox. I reluctantly went on this ministry trip It was six weeks out of my summer, my senior year summer, you know, the one that's supposed to be all fun. And it was during that time that I experienced grace for the first time. I had been to a lot of conferences and youth conferences and and things like that, and, and every single time, Usually at night, at the end of the week, there's this altar call, and conference after conference after conference, I would run up to the altar, lay all my sins down, lay all this down, walk back to my seat, I'm a different person. And then the next year, I'm such a sinner, I know, I'm so, uh, and I would run back down and lay all my baggage down again that I had laid down the year before. And then the next year, the same thing. And the same thing and the same thing. But this year, it was 2009. I don't know what the speaker said. I don't even know who the speaker was that was doing the thing at the time, but I heard God that night. And I was up on these bleachers, not all the way up, about four rows from the top, and it was really, really tall, and and I'm walking down, and as I'm walking, I realized that this was the last time that I'm carrying my past with me that is keeping me from running into the destiny that God has for me. And, And that night, I laid my junk down, Because the enemy wants to keep bringing up the past. The enemy wants to keep bringing up what you did, why you can't go into the destiny that God has for you because of what you've done. And so we'll feel good for about three days after a conference or after church or, or whatever. And then we'll just go back and pick it back up and take it with us again. But I knew that that time was different because he was speaking to me and he said stop doing this son and leave your junk because I have something for you and that night was the night that I was done fighting Jesus was done fighting God and said okay if you want me in full time ministry I'll be in full time ministry I'm not saying you have to go into full time ministry but that was for me I had never felt 
guilt or shame or condemnation for anything in my past since that day. And so one of my favorite things to see is when that happens with other people. Where you can come up here physically and metaphorically lay down your past and leave it. And we'll have Linda come up and show, you know, sweep it away and Linda takes care of our building. Make sure it's clean. And from that day forward, the Bible looked different to me. Church was different for me. Relationships were different for me. My life was changed completely because of the grace that I now understood a little bit more. And I keep asking to understand it more and more every day. And so maybe this is your opportunity to say, God, I'm done fighting you. God, I see you now. God, I see how you have been preparing me. I see how you, you brought me here in this moment. You've you, you made me click on this link at this moment to, to hear this word from you. And God, I lay down my junk. I lay down my past. I lay down all of this stuff because you have prepared for me something that I can't do on my own, but I'm going to follow you into the destiny that you've laid out for me. So here's what we'll do. It might be weird. Whatever. Weird is cool. Isn't that what we learned last week? If, if you are hearing from God right now, and the enemy has been at you and saying, you can't do this because you've done that. You can't go there because you've done this. Don't you remember what you said? Don't you remember what you did? I'm telling you, shut that up right now. Carry that up here. If you want to stay at your seat, leave it at your seat. And I'm telling you, grace is pouring into you right now. Peace is pouring over you right now. You just have to receive it. And you can't hold on to the old person and hold on to grace at the same time. It's too big. So let that go and embrace the grace that God has for you. And when we do that, your life is going to be so transformed. And I promise you, you will have trouble. But take heart, he has overcome the world. So if you need to do that today, do it now. When when the disciples were waiting after Jesus told them, don't leave Jerusalem yet, but wait for the gift that I have for you. I like to speculate on what they did. We know that they stayed in the upper room and they prayed and they worshiped and they did all that. I, I, I wonder what was going on in their heads though. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit rushes in 
And Peter realizes what's going on. And he says, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. This is what Jesus was talking about. This is the gift that we've been given so that we can go out and transform the world. And, and immediately they, they stand in front of thousands of people. And Peter preaches one of the coolest sermons ever. And he says, you people did this. You people killed Jesus. You people did all of this. But it had to happen. You had to go through with this. He had to go through what he went through. So that we could receive what we are receiving right now. And they left that place completely changed. Just like John the Baptist, his his whole purpose in life was to lead people to that light. In John 1, it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. You have the light living inside of you if you have Christ. And we are witnesses to point people to him, to lead people to Jesus, to say, this is who I used to be. This is what I used to do. This is what I used to say. But then I met somebody named Jesus. Christmas weekend, I met somebody named Jesus, and I am completely different. And you go back to your families, you go back to your workplace, you go back to school, and people around you are like, what the heck happened to you? And you say, God, God, God showed me his grace. God showed me his mercy. And I'm a completely different person, and I'm full of joy, and I can't really fully explain it to you, but I know that you're seeing something in me, I'm seeing something in me, and I just want more and more and more and more of this. And grace upon grace upon grace is just overflowing in our lives. And now we get to live like John the Baptist and say, I just got to go out and tell everybody about this, that I've received grace, I've received peace, and you can have the same. That's a power move. We're going to move into communion, where Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, this is what's about to happen. This is what I'm going to do. But I'm going to be living in you. And he takes the bread, and he said, this bread represents my body. Take it in remembrance of me take the bread and he said this wine represents my blood that is spilled for you so that you might have the opportunity to choose life and to choose freedom to choose grace and peace and he says take this in remembrance of me I pray that as God continues to stir in your hearts and as you lay down your past and your sins, the old ways that you walk out of here restored and renewed and free. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for leaving your throne in heaven and coming and dwelling among us and coming in a way that we were not expecting and coming in a way that that you had prepared. God, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to choose life, for dying on the cross, for defeating death, and for being 
raised back to life, alive and well today. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving in our hearts. We thank you for the power that you give us. God, may we be witnesses to the light everywhere we go. We thank you and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. Have a great week. Love you all.